Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Being Me, where we're honored to have the opportunity to speak with Myra Zimmett, founder of the Storyboard Project, a web series created to educate and empower youth transitioning out of the foster care system and into adulthood. Myra is an award-winning filmmaker with over 22 years of writing and producing short and long-form documentaries, educational videos, and digital content. Her documentaries have aired on PBS, Discovery Slash Times, and E! Entertainment. In 2014, she founded the Storyboard Project to give youth with a lived foster care experience the opportunity to highlight their stories. Videos produced by the Storyboard Project have been shared by Journey to Success, Peace for Kids, and PBS SoCal, among others. In addition to her work with the Storyboard Project, Myra worked at USC from 2008 to 2022, first as the Executive Director of Video Production at USC Dornsife, and then later as the Chief Creative Content Officer at USC Annenberg. She served as a primary producer and the director on hundreds of short films for the university and won numerous awards and is a member of the Producers Guild of America. Myra, anything you'd like to add to that very impressive background? You got it. Thank you so much. That was great. Well, we're so happy to have you with us today. There's clearly a lot to talk about. So let's talk. Sounds good. We like to start our Being Me podcasts by asking you to tell us a little bit about teenage Myra. Did you have a nickname? Were you confident? Were you shy? Did you participate in school activities, sports debate? What was teen Myra like? Well, I have a kind of an interesting story for teen Myra. So during my preteen, early teens, I was very shy, very skinny, very preteen awkward. And then right about the summer between 15 and 16, I kind of blossomed a little bit and I decided I didn't want to be that Myra anymore. I didn't want to be shy. I didn't want to be reserved. So I decided that I was going to change who I was. Well, so I go to school. I'm in 10th grade now in the fall and at school, everybody still perceives me as the Myra that I used to be. So I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. And then probably within four or five weeks after I started school, there was this kind of weirdly random riot at our school. And to make a very long story short, I ended up leaving that school and going to another high school. I'm a little further away. And then I got to kind of reinvent myself. Obviously, reinventing yourself is always kind of an ongoing thing. But I realized that who you are and who you want to represent yourself in the world is really only in your head and your own mind. So now when I talk to young people, kind of even more on a mentoring basis, this is one of the things we talk about, like kind of how you change those tapes in your head. So my evolution at that point was a success. And I went back to the original high school the following year and got to be my new Myra self. I love that. Appreciate your sharing with us. Now, before we jump into the storyboard project, I wanted to ask you some questions about foster care and then specifically teens in the foster care system. As you've interviewed and gotten to know teens, what common challenges do teens in the foster care system face? Well, there's a lot. And a lot of the young people I talk to are talking after they turn 18. So a lot of it's reflection because of social workers. There's not a lot that I can have interviews with people who are under 18. So a lot of the common issues are being moved a lot. And really, honestly, the biggest is that a lot of people don't listen. And it's kind of an interesting, I think that to me is the biggest issue with what foster youth would say or youth with a lived experience would say, is that having people listen to them and believe them. And there's a lot of other things around that with love and acceptance and belonging, but it's really what's going on and why isn't somebody listening to my side of the story? How can mentoring help foster youth overcome adversity and achieve their full potential? And what are some successful examples of mentorship programs for this population? And what are mentoring success stories that you've seen with the youth that you've interviewed and worked with? So probably one of the biggest mentoring organizations that's involved with youth and foster care is CASA, a court-appointed special advocate. And the nice thing is they're appointed and they're volunteers So youth already know they're not getting paid. And I think that that's one of the issues that comes up is that you have a lot of people when you're in foster care kind of on the payroll, as it were. You've got your lawyers, you've got your psychiatrists, you've got your social workers, you've got your therapist, you've got your foster parents sometimes, obviously. So you've got a lot of people who are kind of on, as it were, the payroll. And then you have this one person who's there for you. And they're the conduit between you and the court system, basically. So to what I said earlier, is that really wanting somebody to listen when you have a mentor in your life that really, it just gives you somebody 
who hears your story, who believes you, kind of has your back. And that's just super key to that kind of success in terms of finishing school, getting into college or a job that you're looking to do. And there is a lot of organizations. L.A. County has probably one of the largest foster care populations in the country. And there's a lot of great organizations out there that do a lot of wonderful things for both youth who are in the foster care system and youth who are transitioning out. One of the ones that I've been working with is Peace for Kids. They've just celebrated their 25th anniversary and they do a great job of bringing youth together. Sometimes youth are separated, their siblings are separated. So like every Saturday they bring youth together because it's such a longitudinal program, there's a volunteers who've been around for years and it just gives youth, again, somebody who's there for them, who understands them. And it also puts you in a room with other youth who've had similar experiences. So you're not feeling like you're explaining yourself. I think the idea of mentorship is so, so powerful. I'm a psychiatrist and a mentor of mine once said long ago, It only takes one. It only takes that one mentor, that one trusted adult, that one person to really invest in you and to see you and to support you. And I feel like what you've shared is really kind of bringing that idea to life. To me, that ended up being the center of all the stories that I ended up sharing. What happening is I would prompt youth and I'd have them talk about their stories and their journey and then where they are now. But really the question that kind of kept hitting me over and over is what was the conduit? What was the thing that was in the middle that took you from fairly traumatic, if not very traumatic childhood to whatever your idea of success is now? And it was always a person. It could have been faith. It could have been a guidance counselor, a teacher, a mentor, an organization, somebody who saw you and listened to you and had your back. And I think that for youth who don't have biological family behind them, then it's universal. I mean, we all want somebody to have our back. We all want somebody to believe in us. So this isn't just unique to youth in foster care. This is unique to everyone. If you're not getting it at home, having somebody, like I said, in any of those situations to see you has just been critical in the success in my mind, of youth and in their stories. I think that's 100% right. And that is true for their overall mental health and wellness too. We see kids and teens do much better when they have that one person in their corner, that one person who has their back, as you said. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. I wanted to hear from you about what common misconceptions you think people have about teens in foster care. What are those misconceptions? And then how do you think that we can dispel them? One of the organizations I'm working with is doing a lot of work on research. So I'm going to touch on as much as I can recall, but a lot of it has to do with, honestly, media's perception of youth in foster care. So if the media is presenting youth in foster care as criminals, as drug addicts, as derelicts or whatever, then that's how the public perceives them. And I know there's been a lot of work of late with even media understanding lots of populations of people, how they're showing them in the movies and in the stories that they're doing. So part of the problem is that a lot of people perceive youth in foster care as criminals or somebody who was so traumatic and for lack of a better word, broken. So one of the things we've been trying to do is really change those perceptions, change those narratives, because to what we're saying, if we want somebody to have this young person's back, we need that person to know that this young person is through no fault of their own, been put in a system and for whatever reason, their family was not able to take care of them. And sometimes their families were in jail because of drug use or in jail because of abuse. But that doesn't mean that child has that same story. I think a lot of it starts with the media and then that filters down to audiences who are watching it and then their preconceived notions. That's such a good point. It didn't occur to me immediately how much we're influenced by these media portrayals. Really, really important point. I wanted to expand a little bit further than just media and the way that foster kids are portrayed and just think a little bit more broadly. How do you think we can better educate the public as a whole about the challenges that teens face in foster care? And how do you think that we can all work together to create a more supportive and inclusive society for young people? I mean, I want to get to a place where people have empathy for teens in foster care, even though they may not fully understand their experiences. I think that's one of the things that I've been trying to do. By sharing the stories, you're meeting people 
they're authentic. You know what I mean? So it's, here's who I am. Somebody asked me why I'm doing video because sometimes you're seeing this young person's face and you're seeing the motion on their face. You're seeing the reactions and you're getting a chance to kind of meet that person where they're at and build that empathy in there. And they're sharing these stories with legislators. So kind of the answer is when you're in school and somebody asks you and they find out that you have a foster care experience, I remember somebody told me that their teacher outed them in the middle of the class and told everybody in the class that they were in foster care. And that's why they weren't able to do whatever it was that they needed to do. And so it's humiliating. One of the biggest challenges facing foster youth is aging out of the system. Can you explain to our audience what you've learned about that experience from your storyboard project interviews? A lot of young people have talked about aging out at 18. And some of the youth that I've spoken to are a little older actually had to experience aging out at 18 years old. And the organization that I've done some work for, Peace for Kids, one of the young members there, his foster parent, he was in school, he was working, and his foster parents at 18 years old said, I'm sorry, you have to leave. And he's like, I'm in school, I'm working, I just need a place to put my head at night. And she said, I'm sorry, she brought all of her stuff to the organization. And so that kind of started a campaign that they did, which all I did was turn 18. And they did end up bringing that up to Sacramento. And them and a lot of other young people who were advocating for resources and help after 18, a lot of young people and a lot of organizations were really working to advocate for resources to go to youth after they turned 18. So there was now transitional age programs that are popping up. Certainly they popped up in California and in different states around the country, because what they're seeing is if you age out at 18 with no resources, then you're in another pipeline. You're in the prison pipeline. You're in the homeless pipeline. You're in the sex trafficking pipeline. And that's obviously failed young people who have already been failed by their families. So you have a state who's taken you in and said, you were awarded the state. And then you turn 18. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, you should know what to do. But how would you know what to do? I mean, many of these young right. people have gone from home to home to home and they don't know what to do. So right. a lot of these states have come up with transitional age programs where they're teaching life skills, where they're helping with college and fill out a college application, helping them learn how to drive a car, helping them learn how to cook. And so that's been very beneficial. And even then you still think about even 21 or 22 or 24, you still need support from family. And so yeah. a lot of these organizations are now looking at what can we do to make sure that young people are not just aging out, whatever age that is, if it's even early 20s, that they're not aging out and not still have some sort of a connection to somebody right. or something. I wish that process of disconnecting and no longer having the support was based on teens developing and acquiring the skills they need to move on in life in a successful way where they can take care of themselves, right? And not just an artificial distinction of age. Age is just a number. What really happens on your birthday versus the day before? Did you magically become more capable of doing these things that you have never been exposed to or never learned before? I mean, I think if we were to create some sort of shift so that there's a series of things that young people need to learn and then say, okay, if you've learned it on your 18th birthday, great. But if it takes a few years longer, that's okay too. And just kind of anchor it around a different perspective. I think it'd be so much more supportive for foster teens and also just for kids and teens in general. You still go back to, it doesn't matter how old you are. You know, Mm -hmm. you still want, you still need somebody in your corner. And I think that's the most important thing is how do we help young people open up and trust and bring those people and people to understand that youth have had these kind of sometimes unfortunate upbringings and that they're looking to have a great life. They're looking to not spend the rest of their life in whatever trauma they had as children. And so the young people, the older people to, to step up and like you said, do the mentoring and have the back of some of these young people. I think it really helps young people rebuild that sense of trust and security as well later on in life. Now, I think what you've done with the storyboard project is really, really wonderful. Can you share with our listeners what sparked the idea for the storyboard project? How did you get involved in advocating for foster youth? Just tell us about it. Sure, of course. I've always been a big reader and a couple of books kind of came across my 
path over the years. And one of them was White Oleander by Janet Fitch. And the other one was The Language of Flowers by Vanessa Diffenbaugh. And both of them dealt with either foster youth or transitional foster youth. And the thing with Vanessa's The Language of Flowers, in the end of it, it talked about you could be a mentor. And so it just stuck with me. And then when I was at USC, I ended up working on this campaign and I ended up working with a young woman who had a live foster care experience. And I was mentoring her. She was one of the presenters and we just kind of became friendly and I would take her to lunch and I'd get to know her. And over the next couple of years, just kind of kept popping up and I just kept seeing her. And I had received my master's degree and I was like, what am I going to do now? Maybe I'll mentor. What is it that I can do? And I had numerous years of background in video production. And so I decided, you know, what if I give young people the chance to kind of tell their story in their own words? And so I actually went to this young woman and another young man who had a live foster care experience and asked them and they're like, wow, that sounds good. So when it started, I don't know how I found young people, but I just kept finding young people who wanted to share their story. And so it became a very much of a collaboration. It's like, this is your story. I wasn't an organization, so I didn't have an agenda. I didn't need them to say something for me. I didn't need them to talk about something in a certain way. So it was a very, just a natural conversation and they opened up and we talked about their journey. And after I edited it, and when I edited it, I also edited it strategically because I'm thinking about, I'm a mother, I'm an employer, I've been an employer. And I wanted to make sure there was nothing in this video that would one day come back and be problematic for them. After the video was edited, they would get a chance to look at it. If they had any questions or comments or wanted something changed, then we would do that. So it was just a really great kind of collaborative process where they didn't have a lot of work to do. They weren't the ones filming themselves and having to edit it, but they were able to sit there and share what they wanted to share and know that, again, somebody had their back to make sure that whatever was going out there was what they wanted to say. I imagine that some of these stories really help teens in their foster care in foster care develop a sense of identity and belonging. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and just how storytelling can help in this way. One specific story, I interviewed this young man named Marquise. He had never shared his story before. And I'm not even sure right now how he found me, but we did a story and it was just a sweet, loving, moving story about his experience. And then he wrote me a few years later to tell me that he really thought about wanting to really share it even more. And he wrote a book. The idea of the videos is to give other youth a chance to look at this person and say, okay, they had a similar experience as I did and they trusted somebody and they believed in somebody and this is where they're at now. And so maybe I want to think about the idea of I'm not going to close myself off to adults the rest of my life. You know, that teachers always seem like they've had an interest in me. I'm going to go talk to them or that guidance counselor or my pastor. So the idea is in that regard is for young people to kind of see this and realize they can do that too. And the other part of it is to let people in legislation, people who are making laws and decisions know that these resources and the things that young people need to be successful, they're not always getting. That's the other side of it is that We need resources for mental health. We need resources to help young people get out of school. We need resources to let them learn how to drive. So I think that the purpose of the stories is just to share what's happening out there with other people in the foster care world to hopefully enact some sort of change. So while they're sharing it, I think a lot of young people, I ask them about identity and who they are, but... I think that's maybe the same question we're asking any young person. How do you see yourself? Mm -hmm. And I don't think young people necessarily want foster cares to be one of their intersectional ideas. They want to be, I'm creative. I'm an artist. I'm a musician. I am a reader. I like to hike. I think that from a lot of stories, it's like, who am I? And who am I is not a youth in foster care, I think. That's really important. I think that question of who am I gets at this idea of identity. I do imagine that teens who are in the foster system, who watch some of these web stories, will see other teens and be reflecting on their own experiences and their own identities as well. And then feel validated too and feel less alone. And then also feel hopeful for what's to come and see how other people have kind of worked through their experiences and where they've ended up. 
You know, there's one story in particular that caught our attention. It was the interview with Eltuan Dawson. He opens his story by describing his childhood and foster experience as being loved, hated, hurt, and healed. And it was clear that his experience was very complex and multifaceted. I'm wondering how you think that his story and some of the other stories like this can, again, better help us understand the foster care system and what some of these teens experience. So one of the thing about Eltuan's story and other young people is they're sharing very specific details about what's difficult. So, for example, one of the young people talked about how they went into the classroom and they're in like an algebra geometry classroom. And all of a sudden they realize that teacher is teaching a concept they haven't even learned yet. So they're kind of behind the eight ball. And another one talked about something similar, but they're like, how are you supposed to sit down and learn something when there's all this stuff going on in the backstory, all this stuff going on in your life? You don't know where your siblings are. You don't know if you're going to be reunited. You don't even know if the house you're staying at tonight is the house you're going to be in in three days from now. So how are you supposed to go in and learn something? And so a lot of the stories have to do with the idea that just see me for who I am. And I think a lot of young people, there's things where a foster parent, I think it's called a seven day and you could just give somebody seven days notice and then you're out of here. And it could be as much as I just didn't like your attitude. And we all know anybody who has teenagers have had teenagers or been a teenager, there's oftentimes you don't like your child's attitude. And it's like to think that if that attitude would get you kicked out of your house in seven days, A lot of young people talk about when they get moved into a foster home that they know that they're a foster kid, that they know that they're not that person's child and they're not treated as a child. Sometimes their refrigerator's locked. Sometimes they're not even allowed to come into the house while the parent's getting ready for work. So there's a lot of things that are happening that you just feel like you just don't belong. There are good homes and the good homes treat young people like they are part of their lives. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for foster parents who treat a young person as though they are that person's child or that they care about that person. Okay, Myra, one final question. What advice would you give to these children and teens who are currently in the foster care system? The advice that I would give is really more the advice that I've heard other foster youth who've aged out give and that just be patient, that it will get better. I talked to a young person the other day who's in her early 30s, and she said, if I can tell myself at 18, I would just say, it's okay, slow down. Don't try to make everything happen at once. It's all going to work out. And I think that listening to other foster youth and just finding that person, you know, opening up whatever that looks like for you and hopefully having a good experience with it, but finding that person who you can trust to have your back, to know that there are people out there who have a lot of love in their heart and that there is going to be somebody there for you who loves you and who cares about you. And sometimes it may not feel that way, but that person will show up for you at some point. And this too shall pass (laughs) and that you just kind of have to get through it and get through the system. And then you can create the life and the family that you want to create. Thank you for that. And thanks again, Myra, for being on the podcast today. The work that you're doing and the stories that you share are so, so important. To watch Myra's interviews and hear the personal stories of teens sharing their stories, visit YouTube slash The Storyboard Project. You can also learn more about The Storyboard Project at thestoryboardproject.com. Until next time, this is Dr. Neha Chaudhary, my co-host Hazuri Dillon, and our podcast producer, Derek Baird, reminding you to keep being you. 